Soapbox After Dark. I am your host, Jamal Thomas. Um, I can't sleep. And as you know, when real men can't sleep, real men do the news. At least that's how I that's how I make myself okay with this. Um, it, nevertheless, I want to jump across the pond. I want to talk about the Brexit party. Now, this brings in one Mr. Nigel Farage. If you haven't been paying attention to British politics, then you may not know who Mr. Nigel Farage is. That's the bloke behind me that's scrolling. Um, if you don't, if you haven't been paying attention to British politics, you are missing out on this. There is no comparison to a figure in American politics that rivals Farage, meaning we don't have a comparison to Farage. And I tried to figure out what can I give these people to explain who this guy is. So Farage is what you would call a Eurosceptic. He's a Brexiteer. He wants to get Britain out of the European Union. And he's been in British politics for like a decade with this campaign of we want to get Britain out of the European Union. That is my job. And he's gone to the European Union, meaning he's a, 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 he's a member of the European Union's parliament. He's an MEP in the European Union's parliament who is a your skeptic of that institution. Think of how amazing that is. He's in an organization that he doesn't believe should exist. And every opportunity that he gets when the mic comes to him, he is screeching at the height of his lungs that Britain needs to get out of the European Union while being a member of that same European Union. It is an amazing thing to watch. And, you know, he comes across as he, his political casting, his image, is I'm just the ordinary bloke I'm just a bloke getting a beer. I'm just like you, but I want to get us out of the European Union. Now, we are cynical enough to know that political casting is not necessarily indicative of what the person actually is and what the person actually espouses. Paul Ryan screaming about wanting to protect Medicare and Social Security by cutting Medicare and Social Security doesn't mean, in fact, he wants to protect those things, regardless of how much he talks about it. Same thing is true of one Mr. Nigel Farage. Farage started UKIP. UKIP became somewhat of a widely understood to be a racist institution at this point. So it's interesting that Farage created the Brexit party. And I want to talk about the political differences and the political reasoning for that. Um, but, but what needs to be understood, and the most interesting part here, is that the Brexit party that Nigel Farage has just created has exploded onto the British the Brexit scene. And they've taken the lead. It's it's hard to get this across. This is pretty amazing. That they have no policies. When Farage was asked about policies, he couldn't give an answer to policies. He's like, hey, we're a new party. We're just starting. And yet, they've been able to take the lead with regards to people who in the European elections that are coming up. Just to, to be specific. Nigel Farage's new Brexit party has surged ahead in opinion polls for the next month's European parliamentary elections, with the new survey suggesting it's on course to leave Labour and Conservatives trailing in its wake. The YouGov poll placed the party at 27% within a week of its launch, putting it ahead of Labour, who has 22%, and Conservatives, with 15%, just weeks ahead of the 23rd of May elections. Farage's new party that has really no policy objectives, no policy goals, have taken the lead with regards to the new European elections that are coming up. And by virtue of taking the lead on these elections, have freaked out members of parliament that was wavering on this thing of whether or not to support May's deal. Her deal was dead on arrival as it was, but this made it just that much more so. Maybe let's say nailing in the coffin and throwing the coffin in the ocean. I was trying to find something that gives across who Farage is. And I think I know the video. If aliens attacked the planet and said, you give us the most farage video of Farage that you have at your disposal, or else we would destroy this planet. This is the video that I think they would pull up. This is the video. And just to explain what's taking place in this video, Farage has gone on a one-man campaign to get Britain out of the European Union. And like I said, every opportunity that he got to get in front of a mic, he wouldn't shut up about it. 
That was his thing. That was his calling card. And like I said, whatever you want to think of Haraj, like I said, no policy or anything else. He's not just an average bloke. Um, he has a certain agenda associated with him, regardless of his political castings. Anybody who is even against him has acknowledged that the man speaks amazingly well. He speaks amazingly well. Like he is extraordinarily good at what he does. And so this is the video that I think is a perfect representation of Farage. This is the day that they voted to leave the European Union. Nigel Farage has been on this one man campaign to get Britain out of the European Union. And if anybody has watched European Union, I mean European parliaments, <laughs> he's, you know, there are several videos of him, like, like doing this thing in the parliament. But this is the day that they decided to leave the European Union. Their first meeting back after Britain voted to leave the European Union. And again, Farage has been doing this for like a decade. And he's continuously saying, we're going to leave, we're going to leave, we're going to leave. This institution sucks. We're going to leave. And Britain has said, yes, we're leaving. And Farage finally gets the opportunity to come to the mic. This is what goes down. This is an awesome, awesome video. Good morning. They're booing him. They're booing him. <laughs> He's about to strut. <laughs> They're booing him. Thank you very much for that. Very warm welcome. Um, how things have changed. Just a second, Mr. Farish. Ladies and gentlemen, one major quality of democracy is that you listen to those even if you don't share their opinion. Well, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? And the reason you're so upset, the reason you're so angry, has been perfectly clear from all the angry exchanges this morning. You, as a political project, are in denial. You're in denial that your currency is failing. You're in denial... Well, just, well, just look at the Mediterranean. No, 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 as a, as a policy to impose poverty on Greece and the rest of the Mediterranean, you've done very well. And you're in denial over Mrs. Merkel, Mrs. Merkel's call last year for as many, any people as possible to cross the Mediterranean into the European Union has led to massive divisions between countries and within countries. But the biggest problem you've got, and the reason, the main reason the United Kingdom voted the way that it did, is you have, by stealth, by deception, without ever telling the truth to the British or the rest of the peoples of Europe, you have imposed upon them a political union. You've imposed upon them a political union. And when the people in 2005 in the Netherlands and France voted against that political union, when they rejected the constitution, you simply ignored them and brought the Lisbon Treaty in through the back door. What happened? What happened last Thursday was a remarkable result. It was indeed a seismic result, not just for British politics, for European politics, but perhaps even for global politics too. Because what the little people did, what the ordinary people did, what the people who, who have been oppressed over the last few years and seen their living standards go down, they rejected the multinationals. They rejected the merchant banks. They rejected big politics. And they said, actually, we want our country back. We want our fishing waters back. We want our borders back. We want to be an independent, self-governing, normal nation. And that is what we have done. And that is what must happen. And in doing so, The strength of Farage's argument is that there are elements of this that are absolutely right. Now, when this got to the, you know, what does this look like in real terms, UKIP ended up just just bashing immigrants to some degree. I mean, let's keep it real. The main policies were based on immigration. 
at least that I've seen, I could be completely wrong on this, but everything that I've seen of UKIP, especially when members of UKIP were espousing their policies, a lot of this boiled down to immigration. So you can imagine the people who ended up in UKIP on this. But if you're if but if you listen to him, what he's saying here is not necessarily wrong on its face. They did impose a union. I mean, understand this started off as a business cartel, and this business cartel took on more and more powers, just almost kind of a political momentum, um, turning itself into a union of sorts, political union of sorts. So he's not necessarily wrong. And again, just to make this point, Italy's can't implement the economic policies that Italy wants to implement. Same thing with the UK if Jeremy Corbyn took office and same thing with Syriza and Greece. I'm just saying it is to some degree a political union and it does put a certain pressure on those governments um, that prevent them from implementing policies that they themselves may want to implement. That's to the benefit of those countries. So he's not entirely wrong on this when he's making this case. This is the strength of Farage when he's making these arguments. Um, and then the argument is made from a perspective, almost a left wing perspective. But again, you get into real world terms of what does it mean? And this is to some degree political casting, even though what he's saying in this political casting is not necessarily wrong. Let, let's let him finish because there's this turns in a moment because even Farage himself, regardless of wanting to get out of the, the European Union, accepts political realities. And in this speech, there's an acceptance of these political realities when the, the speech turns from chest stomping, ha 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 ha, you bitches aren't laughing now, to, hey, you know, now we need to work on, you know, mutual relations so we don't necessarily punish one another. <laughs> like it turns almost on a dime. Let's let him finish. I want to hear him finish this. And in doing so, we now offer a beacon of hope to Democrats across the rest of the European continent. I'll make one prediction this morning. The United Kingdom will not be the last member state to leave the European Union. So the question, the question is, what do we do next? Now, it is up to the British government to invoke Article 50. And I have to say that I don't think we should spend too long in doing it. I totally agree, uh, Mr. Juncker, that the British people have voted. We need to make sure that it happens. But what I would like to see is a grown-up and sensible attitude to how we negotiate a different relationship. Now, now I, know, I know that virtually none of you have ever done a proper job in your lives <laughs> or, worked, or worked in business or worked in trade, or indeed ever created a job. But listen, just listen. Look at the woman behind him. Look at her, look at her. She's like, she's like, oh, that's brutal and fucking hilarious. You can laugh. You can laugh. You don't have to cover your mouth. You can laugh. That shit's funny. <laughs> He's like ribbing them. But understand what's taking place in this language, even as he ribs them, like even he as he tears into the bunch of people, you know, like and what he said, he's been doing this for nearly two decades trying to get out of the European Union. And this is his day. This is his redemptive day. This is the day that Farage get what he wants. And God damn it, he's going to chest stump. And that's the chest stump speech. Like this is why this speech is awesome, because this is built for 20 years, for nearly 20 years of him with this one single man campaign. Can you, do you have anything that you've been trying to do for 20 years that a large body of institutions were against you in doing so and you finally get that thing done? What do you do on that day? Like what is, like God damn it, man. What do you do on that day? This is that day for Farage. This is that speech. That speech has been saving up for 20 years. Now, in this speech, he is chest stomping. He is ribbing them remorselessly. But if you notice, the language is changing. Subtly, it's changing. He's ribbing them, but he's like, hey, look, we need to have a grown-up relationship. We need to have a grown-up relationship. Because what Farage understands is that if you rip Britain out of the European Union in a certain way, meaning if you just pull it out, 
there are consequences to that. Those are economic consequences that those quote unquote little people that he's talking about are going to be greatly and grossly adversely affected. So he wants to have a grown up conversation now about what takes place afterwards because he understands there are consequences to this one man campaign that he's been waging. Let's let him finish. And I want to go to this idea of UKIP versus Brexit Party. Public. Mr. Yeah. Fresh, just a second. Has He's done uh, a decent job in their life. You can't really say that. I'm sorry. Now you're quite, uh, you're quite right, Mr. Schultz. UKIP used to protest against the establishment, and now the establishment protests against UKIP. So something has happened here. Let us listen to some simple, pragmatic economics. We, between us, between your countries and my country, we do an enormous amount of business in goods and services. That trade is mutually beneficial to both of us. That trade matters. If you were to decide to cut off your noses, to spite your faces, and to reject any idea of a sensible trade deal, the consequences would be far worse for you than it would be for us. Now that's nonsense. That's utter nonsense. Like, I give you the entirety of that first part of the speech. I don't know what those people creating jobs or whatnot, but I give you the entirety of that first part of that speech. And I listen to the first part and it says, fair enough. Fair enough. I can't deny that perspective at all. And then you get into this right wing, you know, I'm going to chest thump and I'm going to try to convince who that Britain in one country is somehow going to deal with the economic might of the other 27. You have lost your mind. You've lost your mind. It is true that you guys have trade. It is true that it would hurt the European Union, but that hurt is proportional, meaning it bifurcates, or, or bifurcates is the wrong word, but it's dissipated throughout the 27 other countries. You are just one. You are just one. I am sorry. They would find other ways to replicate the goods and services that Britain offers. I guarantee you that. And this will be extraordinarily disadvantageous to Britain. But this is chest thumping. This is politics. But the politics doesn't fool anyone. The politics doesn't fool anyone. Now, let's get into this idea of UKIP versus um, the Brexit party. Nigel Farage spurned the UKIP by creating a Brexit party. Now, he's made the argument that those guys are somewhat racist. And I told him not to let the races in the party, but they like the races in the party. So I needed to create a different party. Now, some of this is purely politics. He didn't want to reassociate himself with a party that had gone, that had a certain point of view, that meaning the, the, there's a certain politics around it. It looks a certain way. Um, and to be honest, it may be the way that it looks. So don't misunderstand me. But either way, whether it's true or not, he didn't want to associate himself with that. And he felt that it hindered what he wanted to do, which is, I want to get Britain out of the European Union. And apparently I need to re, um, re-enliven in this campaign. So you're skeptics are going to the European Union and God knows what they're going to do when they get there. And the question becomes, what does that mean for British politics here, there on the home front in the UK? Because if the Brexit party does extraordinarily well in the polls and these guys start running for office in the UK itself, that is going to suck votes away from the Conservative Party. That's the first point. But does it also mean it will freak out members of the Tory party? that may be wavering on this idea of Brexit and make them even that much more ideologically against Theresa May's deal? I think that answer is probably going to be yes. What does that mean on the home front? British politics have gotten extraordinarily fascinating. Um, I'm not sure how many Americans are paying attention to it, but God knows it is a fascinating deal of what is taking place. In our politics, we deal with states. We deal with the federal government. We deal with these members. But this is a separate thing. If the United States was negotiating something with, let's say, 27 other member nations, and we are, like, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. Britain is in negotiations with 27 other member nations as it extricates itself. And even as it extricates itself, it has become so reliant on the trade with those nations that this will disrupt all sorts of things in Britain. But they need to work their way out through it. And they can never, they can't come to any idea or agreement on what that A, the withdrawal, is going to look like in and of itself. But definitely, even after withdrawal, the future relationship between Britain 
and the European Union. And there are other considerations to deal with, meaning there are other obligations that Britain needs to abide by that runs contrast to them leaving the European Union. It is fascinating, fascinating politics. So I will leave this here. Nigel Farage, the Brexit Party. Um, it's hard to know what the Brexit Party is going to look like in real terms. When you ask them for policy, they say, look, we've just started. We don't have any policy. We have one policy. We want to get us out of the European Union. So this notion of, you know, what are they going to push for on the economic front? It is not going to be to the left. It is not going to be to the left. I, I'll tell you that much. So it's hard to know, but I would make the point that the people don't care. They just don't believe that the government is fulfilling the obligations of the referendum. And on a secondary note, if you ask these people why they want to leave the European Union, I think they'd be hard pressed to come up with concrete ideas. I think what it will boil down to is this thing of sovereignty. It is our country. We should be able to make the laws for our country. Then I have a hard time disagreeing with them on that. So I will end this here. If you guys enjoy the content, please feel free to share, like, subscribe. You can always support through PayPal or Patreon. Thanks all. And this, and